Thank you. Today we have almost unlimited access to information, resources, people of all varied expertise. And that's great for enhancing collaboration, for the sharing of ideas, for accelerating progress. We know that it can empower, it can support, and it can give a voice to those who might not otherwise be heard. But there's also lots of complications with this global communication network. In the cancer field, people are constantly bombarded with messages. They hear that everything you drink, eat, smoke, oh, smoking, yeah, that causes cancer. But everything you put on your skin can cause cancer. Sometimes they wonder, you know, do researchers really know what's causing cancer? I know of children that get cancer, athletes that get cancer, but yet my 90-year-old grandma smoked all her life and never had as much as a cold. And then, of course, you turn on your computer and you read that cancer has actually been cured and that somebody somewhere is suppressing it and that medicine is only succeeding in making us sicker. As a researcher, I realized that we have to do a better job of telling our story. And so for me, my story is gonna start off inside the cell. That's where I'm most comfortable, but that's also where cancer begins. If you look up at the screen, you can see that a lot is going on in this cell. The cell's preparing to divide and then dividing off into two separate cells. Every time that event happens, literally thousands of things have to be perfectly coordinated, many of which you can't see with your naked eye. Since the time your mom met your dad, and the first cells started to form within the egg, this event had to happen literally trillions of times. Your body is composed of about 37 trillion cells. And as you're sitting here right now, those cells continue to grow and divide. Our cells are perfectly coordinating these events based on the chemical strings that lie within your cell DNA. DNA is organized into codes that we call genes. Genes do lots of different things. One of the things they do is make proteins. Proteins are the workhorses of your cells. They make a cell look as it should look and function as it should function. If you look up on the screen on your left, you see three cells from your brain, on the right, three from your blood. These cells look very different and they also function very different from one another. A red blood cell carries oxygen throughout your body. A neuron remains stationary and fires electrical signals. While all of the DNA in each of those cell types in your own body are exactly the same, they can function and look so different because they make different proteins in each and every one of them. I want you to remember that point. In 1979, two men, Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus, figured out something really important. They told us that cancer can be caused by changes to your DNA. Changes can happen because of things we commonly associate with causing cancer, like smoking, the environment, lifestyle choices. But we also know that every time your cell undergoes that complicated process of dividing into two, that there's a random chance that that error will occur. In fact, that random chance is a part of our biology. It's why I'm standing up right here with opposable thumbs. It's what drove evolution. Fortunately, since all of your cells are continuing to divide right now, and there's a random chance that that error could be happening in all of us right now, our cells are really smart. One of the things they do is make proteins that actually protect your cell. They make workmen that can go and find these errors and fix them. So, but one of the things we know is that your grandma then, who could smoke all her life, had amazing genetics, right? She had lots of those workmen. But as we age in all of us, those workmen gradually decline. And so our uh, genetics and aging are two of the biggest risk factors of getting cancer. And until we can control our genetics, until we can prevent aging, we can never completely prevent cancer from occurring. It's here to stay. So what are we going to do about it? First, we have to understand what that change to the DNA can do. So as your DNA changes, one of the things that happens is those proteins that are doing the job downstream also change. They either think they're Hercules and they do way too much, or they get super lazy and they sit on the couch and do nothing at all. And because the proteins that are doing a job in every different cell are different from one another, the proteins that are driving glioma or brain cancer are very different from those driving blood cancers. Cancers are very different diseases, and they have to be treated as such. So this is a tremendous problem. We have something that we can't completely control from ever happening, and it's got great diversity in, in the kinds of cells that it can affect. So what are we going to do? 
In the 1950s, right around the same time as we were figuring out what DNA even was, the National Cancer Institute paired up with the United States Department of Agriculture to launch the first official war against cancer. Their idea was simple. They were going to get their hands on every plant and animal extract that they could. They were going to put it on a battery of cancer cells. They were going to figure out which ones killed cancer cells. They were going to extract the chemicals. We were going to cure cancer. That noble plan took 20 years, and they came out with 12 hopeful uh, cures for cancer. One of them was a, a compound that came from the bark of a tree called the yew tree. This is a drug called Taxol that you may have heard of. It's still in clinical trials today. From the time they discovered Taxol in the bark of that tree to putting it in a compound that could actually go out to patients, it took 31 years and cost about $32 million. In 1993, it then took a pharmaceutical company, Bristol-Meyer, an investment of $320 million to get that drug into production so it could be used in people around the world. It went out first for women with the most virulent forms of breast and ovarian cancers. In 1995, for the first time in history, we started to see an increase in survival and a decrease in, in death rates for women with these really aggressive forms of cancer. But one of the things we realized is that these, these chemotherapy drugs worked by hitting on some of the basic principles of cancers. They affected how the cells are growing and dividing. I said your cells are growing and dividing right now. Cells of your blood, your skin, your gut. We knew that with these chemotherapy drugs, they not only hit on the cancer, but they also hit on those cells, causing a lot of side effects. In addition, while some people may have responded wonderfully, it didn't work for everyone. And so we had to figure out why, and we had to do better. And so scientists went back to the drawing board, and we said, okay, we know cancer is being caused because of changes to your DNA, and changes to the DNA cause changes to the proteins. So can we then hit on these proteins and changes to your DNA? Well, we knew that some proteins drove certain cancers. For example, in breast cancer, hormones drove breast cancer. So we made the drug tamoxifen, which hits on the estrogen signaling pathway, and boom, breast cancer patients that were driven by that mechanism, it increased their survival. This was a proof of principle that this idea could work. But could we do this on a global scale? Well, in 2001, in my postdoc lab, it took us well over a year just to read about 70,000 bases of this DNA. Your average DNA, or your DNA actually does, have three billion of these letters. Doing my math, that works out to about 50,000 years of work. So in 2001, I would say, no, this is not possible. Fortunately, because of research and innovation, people figured out how to automate that process of reading the DNA. And in 2003, Wellcome Trust published the first ever complete sequence of the human genome. Now what took us well over a year to do in 2001 literally can take 15 minutes today. That changed the pace at which we can do research. And we didn't stop with just reading the code of your DNA. We figured out how to look at how that DNA is packaged into a cell, something called the epigenome. We figured out a way to read all of the proteins and all of the different levels of these proteins in every different cell called the proteome. We figured out how to look at the metabolism of every different cell called the metabolome. We have an ohm for everything. And quite literally, we can put all of these together and get a complete map of everything that's changing in a cancer patient's cells. So you might say, well, that's fantastic. Make a map of my cancer, you know, tell me what's wrong with me, give me a drug, and I'm gonna leave here. And that's a perfect plan. And in, in concept, that idea can work. But there's still many barriers in our path. First of all, not all centers have the access to the technology to do all of these different things. Right now they're in research, and they're in uh, clinical trials to a limited extent. So it's a matter of getting that technology out to all of these different centers. In addition, what we've realized is that all of these technologies generate reams of data. And so it takes people, bioinformaticians, that are amazing at this work, to put their heads together and figure out ways that we can coordinate the data and we can look at it as one picture. And then what we've realized is that it's not just one or two changes to a cancer person's cells, it's thousands of changes. So how do we figure out which changes do we hit on? Well, fortunately, we're starting to figure out how to map all of these changes in sort of an easier way. So what the bioinformaticians do is they make a map. 
In this case, they would make a map where they would take the guys that are acting like Hercules and make them red. And they would take the guys that are laying on the couch and doing nothing in your cells, and they'd make them blue. And then we'd lay it out on this kind of graph. And what you might not be able to see from your seats is that this is hundreds of patients with glioblastoma multiforme, one of the most aggressive forms of brain cancer, one of the ones I focus on in my lab. Down every single pixelated line in here, which you certainly cannot see, is every patient's changes to their cell. What you might be able to see is that there's actually globs of color on this block. What that told us is that people aren't just randomly changing all over the place, but in fact there are groups of patients that make similar changes. So then, can we go in and can I say, well, if you're the patient on the far left, you fall into this group that makes these common types of changes. Can we change type protein A, protein B, protein C? And can we figure out if that's a cure for that group of patients? So what we do is we take tissues, brain tumor tissues, uh, or breast cancer tissues in our lab, and we put them into different types of situations. We put them in a dish, we put them in mice, we use a high throughput screen where we use these fish that are no bigger than your fingernail, and we manipulate proteins A, B, and C for those patients. And we say, what's happening to those patients? This below is a patient's uh, cells from glioblastoma multiforme patient from Henry Ford, and you can see the dotted lines on the bottom are how that patient's cells are growing. By hitting on A, B, and C, we've caused that patient's cells with the most aggressive, one of the most aggressive forms of cancer to start slowing down. Then what we have to do, in this case, this protein does not yet have a drug made against it. So we have to work with our chemistry colleagues to make a drug against that mechanism. And then we work with clinicians to get that drug out into the clinic. We move it out into phases of clinical trials where we test it for safety, and we test it to make sure that we're making an improvement in the person's life. So this is not an easy one-step answer, right? It takes time. And the answers that we're getting are for one group of patients. But it's where science has led us. Over the last seven decades, since that first initial war against cancer was claimed, we know what cancer is. We know that you can protect yourself against some of these harmful mutations, but sometimes you can do everything right and cancer is still going to happen. And even when it does, we have it now a toolbox, an arsenal of things that we can start to do to protect you against your cancer. We're at a point now where we're going to use the beneficial aspects of that global communication network, start putting our heads together and working as a team to make this process faster and more efficient. When people come to me and they say, you know, where's all that money going that we put towards cancer research? It strikes me that people think of this as a lottery where they bought a ticket and there's some prize that's not yet been claimed. But in reality, it's like building a wall. And in this case, the wall is protecting us. It's protecting us against the mortality rates from cancer. And the stronger and the taller we build that wall, the safer we are. Over the last seven decades, we've built a really strong foundation. And in places, we've started to build that wall up. But there's other places where we still have a lot of work to do. This wall isn't just being built by doctors and researchers like me, but it's being built by all of us. Every time you run or bike for cancer, you go on a gala, you put your dollar towards cancer research, you're putting a brick in the wall. And you're making the wall stronger, and you're making the world safer for all of us and our families. So thank you.